So the question we looked at last week is how do believers become connected to meaningful community so that they can be cared for and encouraged in the faith? So we looked at several layers of that last week, but most importantly, we looked at the word humility or humbleness. Humbleness is the foundation for meaningful community. So this last week, um, this is what we're going to look at on the topic of go. Let me give you the definition, um, and then we'll work together in the text. So on the screen and in your notes, go is this. We want believers to use and discover their unique gifts that God has given them so that they might create disciples in their community and around the world. We want believers to use and discover their unique gifts that God has given them so they might create disciples within their community and around the world. We're going to head back to Philippians, if you want to turn there with me. Last week we were in Philippians 2, 1 through 11. This week will be easy, Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Uh, In the back of your notes is all the main passages that we're going to look at. Everything else should be on the screen. Okay, Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 1, I'm reading out of the ESV, Uh, I'll read the full text and then pray and then uh, we'll start. Hold on, we got (laughs) to... There it goes, sorry. We'll blame Tom on that one, right? (laughs) I'm just kidding. All right, let's read. All right, chapter 3, verse 1, it says... Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is of no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason For confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as righteousness under the law, blameless. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, become like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let me give you a heads up this morning. Most of this message isn't going to make like a ton of sense until the end, okay? Just as a heads up, all right? So just got to stick with me, and we'll get there. So uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 1 again, working through the text, verse 1 says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is of no trouble to me, And it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So Paul, he's not ashamed to use this heavy language. He says, dogs, evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh, speaking about circumcision. It's this stern warning to those in Philippi who've come under some severe persecution in their life. And it's not the first time Paul has talked like this. Either We saw it in verse 1 where he says, it's no trouble to write the same things to you. Paul is constantly bringing this before the believers in Philippi, and it's important for them, and it's also important for us today. Christians should be very mindful that there are those that think the Bible's pointless, right? There are those that think there's no such thing as absolute truth. There are those that claim to be Christians, but they don't believe Jesus was fully God. There are those that twist the Bible to conform to their feelings. Paul wants us to look out or be aware of people that are against followers of Jesus. But to be clear, beware 
is not the same thing as fear. Okay, we have no need to fear those that are against us. Awareness is not fear that produces anger. Okay, awareness is clarity of who you are and who you're not. That's what Paul, Paul's getting at in the text. He doesn't want you to go to work or here in a few weeks go to school and be afraid of people that don't think like you. Okay, Paul wants you to know that there are people that are against you, and that's okay because you have the Holy Spirit in Jesus. And then Paul, he shares this dividing line for us in verse 3. Verse 3 says, For we are the real circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. We worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. That's the entire theme of what we studied in the book of Galatians together. Paul is stating that our faith in Christ creates the dividing line between us and everyone else. Always has and always will. There is this massive dividing line between believers and those that do not believe. And it might be different than what you're thinking. Okay, on the screen, this is a long one. Matthew 10, starting in verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over... Do not be anxious of how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all, not for your name's sake, but for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. See, the cross of Christ always separates. Always. Believers are not like everyone else. We do not believe the same things as everyone else. Christians like to think, this is where I think this is a pressure point for us, we like to think we're so different from the world by the way that we act. Okay, our behavior is not what separates us from the world. What separates us from the rest of the world is Jesus. Jesus is the dividing line, not how well you follow him. So you might be thinking, well, so should Christians not act differently than others? Of course. That's why some of you are here this morning and not sleeping in on a Sunday morning. But the act of coming to church doesn't make you different. Coming to church to worship Jesus is what makes you different. Okay, we are the people of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus Christ always has and always will create this dividing line for us. And then Paul, he continues on the text, uh, which what I would describe as just kind of bragging about himself. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh... I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. The Apostle Paul was a respected and wealthy man among the Jewish people, and I call this bragging because that's exactly what it sounds like. So let me just list some of Paul's reasoning here, Okay. You can find it in the text. He's circumcised on the eighth day and the Hebrew of Hebrews. He's from the nation of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. To the law, he's a Pharisee, which means he kept the law pretty well. To zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. And to righteousness in the law, he was found blameless. It would be very difficult to find a more perfect Jew until Paul meets one on the road to Damascus. That's what Paul's setting up here in the text, looking at verse 7. Verse 7 says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul makes an, a, a, this emphatic statement here in verse 7. Let's not forget this guy's in jail, okay, if you didn't know that. This guy's in jail when he's writing this for his faith in Christ. A man that's been on top of the Jewish world is now in prison. So you would think this would kind of stir some bitterness in his heart, right? Like, why would God allow me to be thrown in prison for serving him? That doesn't make sense. I thought God was supposed to have my back, but it feels like I got stabbed in the back. So just imagine yourself in prison for preaching Jesus. And that might be hard for us here in East Tennessee. You're you're in prison for preaching Jesus, and Paul says, whatever gain I had, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. Everything is a loss. It's rubbish. It's garbage. It's trash. Whatever fancy cars or big houses or nice vacations or large paying jobs or fame or fortune, it's all a loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, what Paul says, everything is a loss compared to surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Do we even understand the heaviness of that statement? Paul is saying ministry for Christ is great. Living my life for Christ is is great. But knowing Christ is the surpassing value. I'm going to give you probably the biggest statement of this whole message Um, It's in your notes, probably one of the biggest statements that I learned in my life that changed the game for me. In your notes, this is your primary mission. Your primary mission is to know Christ and enjoy him. Your primary mission is to know Christ and enjoy him. That's it. That's why you exist. If If you're curious, like, why am I even here? That's your primary mission. That's what God wants for you more than anything else in your life right now. There's this guy named Bill Thrasher. Um, he wrote this book, Living, God, Living Life God Has Planned. And I love what he says on this topic. I'll just read it. He says, our relationship with him, he's talking about Jesus, is the primary thing. Our service for him is secondary. If we aim at the primary thing, we will get the secondary. If we aim at the secondary thing, there is no assurance that we will get it, and for sure we will miss the primary. A person who wants to know God must understand God's purpose for his or her life. God's primary purpose for your life is to build an intimate, loving relationship with himself. The question that you get asked over and over is, what's God's will for my life? Anyone ever thought that one before? Like, Last year, I found myself in this pivotal life decision. I didn't know what to do. There were several options before me. Each option had some pros and cons. Big life decisions are difficult, but you throw a wife and three kids in the mix, and you've just upped the risk, right? What if it doesn't work out? What if I make the wrong decision? What if I ruin everything trying to do the right thing? So it's it's just unbelievably freeing for me to realize that I wasn't going to mess everything up as long as I was fulfilling my primary mission to know Christ and to enjoy him. See, my primary mission is not to be the pastor of East River Park. My primary mission is not to be a great dad. My primary mission is not to change this community or the world. My primary mission is to know Christ and enjoy him. And I can't explain how freeing that was for me. Being at the center of God's will is not trying to guess what God's will is. Being at the center of God's will is knowing him and enjoying him. That's the mission. Paul gets it. Doing things for God are important. He explains that very thoroughly in verses 12 through 16. We're not going to go through it. Paul understands that doing things for God 
doesn't come close to knowing God through Jesus Christ. And he gives us more of that in verse 9. Verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. See, Paul, he has this clarifying statement from verse 6. Remember, Paul says that he was found blameless for the law. If I can make that plain, Paul thought he was a really good person at being really good. But now in verse 9, he understands that he isn't perfect, that his perfection comes from God through Christ Jesus. Every Christian needs to be aware of verse, the verse truth found in verse 9. Your righteousness comes from faith in Christ. And, and you might think like, can he talk about something else? He, we did a whole series of that in Galatians. I'm not because I believe the evil one loves to distort that reality. Because as much as I say your righteousness comes through faith in Christ, I promise you at the end of the service, there would be someone in this room that wouldn't get that. And I've sat with teenagers and explain the gospel to them, and I even had it written down, and you can't e- they couldn't even repeat it back to me. I'm like, at what academic level can you not repeat back what I just told you? And I believe that's the evil one, just distorting the reality of the gospel. Your righteousness comes from faith in Christ. That's why Paul keeps having to say these same things over and over. That's why he clarifies righteousness in verse 9. And then finally in verse 10 it says, That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It's helpful for me just to list things out in the text. So here we go again. This is what Paul says. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. It says to have fellowship in his sufferings, to be conformed to his death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And here's how I look at things, okay? The church in America has this massive problem with people that identify as Christians, and that's about it. And they're good people. Okay, they do good things. They post scripture on Facebook. They might even attend church. They might listen to Christian radio. They probably don't do a lot of cussing. Okay, and they probably don't drink alcohol or smoke. But to be clear, none of that is the call of Christ. Can you say with full confidence today that you want to know the power of the resurrection? You want to have fellowship in his suffering, to be conformed to his death. Let me put it this way. Can you say with full confidence today that nothing in your life right now matters more than knowing Christ? Nothing. No job. No ministry. No family member, no hobby, no sports, no dream, no future plan. No, you can fill in your own blanks. All of it is pointless compared to knowing God. So let me get practical here. How do we make our primary mission knowing Christ and enjoying him? And I think the start of that is just to evaluate your time, right? Like our time reflects our heart. I mean, if we, if we aren't creating space in our schedule to know Jesus and to enjoy his presence, then you probably don't value Jesus that much. So how are we doing with that? This is the part of the message where I make everyone feel bad. Right? I'm just joking, kind of. All right, just a little. This is a struggle. It's a struggle for me, too. Honestly, we can't enjoy something we don't know. Our time reflects our heart. And to be clear with that, it's not adding Jesus to your already busy schedule. Like I personally, for me, I don't need one more thing in my life. Paul uses that terminology three times in verses seven through eight, counted as loss, counted all things to be lost, suffered the loss of all things. See, the funny thing with Jesus is that you have to lose everything to get him. He is asking you to lose your own life. 
It's the epitome of Matthew 13, 45 through 46. It's a parable about a very costly pearl. It'll be on the screen. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So difficult for us. The context, think here, Paul is in prison. Of course he values Jesus more than prison. Like, who wouldn't do that? I'm young enough to admit that I love my iPhone. Anyone else love their smartphone? Okay, I'm just too young. Sorry, appreciate it. Okay, it has maps and games and alarms and movies and music and social media and texting and a flashlight and a camera and a compass and a calculator and obviously a lot more things. You can do it on one device. I love technology. Maybe your thing is music or cars. Regardless, I'm not saying these things are bad, but maybe, maybe we just don't value Jesus like Paul does because we're distracted by things that just don't last. That's true for me. We can't keep adding things to our life and act surprised when we don't have a relationship with Jesus. Just one more sports game or practice. One more event to go to. One more TV show to watch. I'm trying to get through Stranger Things. It's taking me a little bit longer than others, okay? One more, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. One more message to send. Something has to give. Like, I'm just as guilty as everyone else. Just because I'm doing ministry work doesn't mean I'm growing in my relationship with God, if you get it. So the the sake of being transparent with you, I can and have easily gone a day at church without ever opening my Bible and praying, what a dangerous way to do ministry or even to live your life. We all struggle. But the brutal reality is spending time with God is a value problem, not a situational problem. So your issue is not that you don't like reading. It's not because the Bible confuses you. It confuses all of us. It's not because you don't have time. What is your surpassing value? So before we switch gears here, I'm just going to, let's just give a few minutes for you to pray. Okay? I'm going to give you a few moments of silence to pray and just ask God, what is my surpassing value right now in my life? And if it's not Jesus, I just confess and ask that Jesus would be your greatest worth. I'll pray and then we'll Uh, finish this whole thing out. God, as our, our church confesses things before you, God, I confess in my own life this week, Jesus has not been my greatest value and worth. My mind has been distracted by so many silly things. And I have neglected spending time in your word. I've neglected praying like I should. So God, help me. Help me every day. Help our church every day to make Jesus the greatest thing in their life. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn to Matthew 28. Again, it's in the back of your notes if you want to do that. I'm going to be in Matthew 28. I'm going to start in verse 16. Um, So if you had no idea where we were going, this is where we're going to close this message out. If you grew up in the church, uh, this is the Great Commission passage. I'll set it up real quick. Jesus has died on the cross. He's come back from the dead. He has a few words to say to some people before he leaves. That's where we're going to be, verse 16. Verse 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some what? 
doubt him. Two reactions from those in the crowd. Okay, some immediately worship Jesus. Can you imagine just the wave of emotions that they have felt? They've given up everything to follow this Jesus guy. He dies a brutal death, and they think it's game over, but they see Jesus. He's alive again. His appearance is like lightning, and his clothes white as snow. It's shocking. They're overwhelmed. They immediately begin to worship Jesus. That's the reaction of some of the people in the crowd. But some doubt it. In all likelihood, there were more than just the 11 disciples at the scene. Okay, there was a crowd of some number, and some in that crowd doubted. Isn't it a little terrifying that you can see Jesus come back from the dead, people worship his glorified body, and not get it? Two reactions in the crowd. Some immediately worship Jesus, and some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Whose authority is it? So when I ask my kids questions, like Bible questions, uh, the money answer is usually Jesus, okay? Okay. He is transferring his authority to fulfill his next words in verse 19. Verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the question that we had was how do we create disciples within our community and around the world. And the answer to that, and it's also in your notes, is that we must be fulfilling our primary mission before we can be commissioned. We must be fulfilling our primary mission before we can become commissioned. This is the first group is fulfilling their primary mission. They're immediately worshiping Jesus, most likely the 11 guys that have been following him. They break out and worship because Jesus is alive. Is that not a gigantic reason of why you're even here this morning? To just enjoy God, to enjoy being in his presence, to focus your entire life on all that he has done for you. But the second group doubted. They're hesitant. Even when Jesus is standing before them, they doubt rather than worship. The point is, I feel confident that the Great Commission, found in verses 19 and 20, is far more for the first group than the second. The Great Commission was breathed into existence for those that know Jesus and his presence. The Great Commission is for those that understand the surpassing value of Christ. If our primary mission isn't rooted in the surpassing value of Christ, why would we even make disciples? Seriously. What motivation would you have to reproduce something that's non-existent in your own life? Why would we baptize others if we haven't been washed in the waters? Why would we teach material we haven't studied for ourselves? We must fulfill our primary mission before we can become commissioned to go out and create disciples in our community, around the world. And to do that, here's three things. Number one is spend time reading your Bible and praying. Spend time reading your Bible and praying. And if you're thinking, please stop telling me to read my Bible and pray, I'm just not going to stop. So you might either need to do it or find another church. I don't know um, what to tell you. This church will not be healthy healthy if its people don't know Jesus. And you get to know Jesus by reading this book. Number two, pray for opportunity to invite. Once you have been fulfilling your primary mission, it is time to be commissioned. So pray this week that God would give you an opportunity to invite someone to meet Jesus. That might simply be inviting them to church. That might mean sharing the gospel with them. But I have prayed for opportunities to invite people, and so far, they have worked 100% of the time. Sometimes it's low-key, like I've 
Uh, and, and other times I'll, I'll have people come up and say like, hey, how was the world created? And you're like, are you serious? Like, okay, that's a good setup. It's a good setup. Pray for opportunity to invite. Lastly, three, pray for opportunities to invest. Invest. See, Jesus did not commission us to make converts. Jesus commissioned us to make disciples. The Great Commission doesn't end with verse 19. It continues into verse 20 where we need to teach believers the scriptures. Invest in a believer in your context. At our last church, we had a police officer that created a Bible study for other police officers where he worked. Invest in a believer outside of your context. Verse 19 doesn't say make disciples of the American nation. It says make disciples of all nations. Go on a mission trip to another country. And Lord willing, we're gonna start sending teams from this church to other countries. Pray about long-term mission work. Not all of us were created to serve in another country, but some of us are. Fund missionaries that are doing the work you cannot do. Ministry costs money. It is what it is. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. We can fund ministry at this church and then around the world. How do we create disciples in our community and around the world? Fulfill your primary mission so you can become commissioned. Ed Stetzer, he wrote an article called Loving the Lost. I'll read it and I'll stop talking. Serving and saving were marks of Christ's life on earth. They should be marks of his people as well. But to do that, we must engage the broken and hurting people around us. I want to be at a church where broken people are welcomed, a church where perfect people aren't allowed a place where people can embark on this journey without having everything figured out from the start. That's hard. But that's what we're called to be. A church without the broken is a broken church. How does your church engage the hurting? What have you done in your own life to avoid insulating yourself from the brokenness around you? And the last question is good, and I'll pray. Are we so concerned about how people view us that we'll never be accused of spending too much time with sinners?